All right, can I have everybody's attention? Um, I want to uh, introduce the speaker tonight, but before I do, I have a couple announcements to make. Um, first off, I, I sent out an email earlier that we're, we're actually phasing out that email list. We found out that there was an issue with the uh, compliance and the way that the University of Houston uh, handles emails. And so instead of going through the email list, we're actually going to be using the Facebook page and we're going to be using uh, our website. So for any future information about seminars, um, you know, uh, if you're not on Facebook, you can always just go to our webpage and that's the um, www.uhcl.edu slash physics and then click on seminars or the section under seminars and for people who are on Facebook we try to update it every week with, um, with the seminar information and if you're members of the UHCL physics Facebook page you'll automatically get an email and uh, there will just be something posted on there every week. Uh, another announcement is I want to let you guys know that this Saturday our, um, our Chile team, the UHCL physics uh, Chile team is playing for the championships and that's going to be over in the, uh, the field next to the Delta building and I believe it starts around 12 p.m. So um, you know we've got a really good team there. You can guys can go there and you can uh, check it out and you can cast votes and uh, you know, see if we come home with a huge trophy. It'd be nice. Uh, next thing is, um, also want to introduce, um, you know, next week our speaker is going to be uh, Shannon uh, Vacher, who's a postdoc at LPI, and he's going to be talking about atmospheric chemistry and substellar atmospheres. And uh, there is a, a sign sheet floating around for this week. I appreciate it if everybody could fill that out. Now, for our speaker this week, um, I guess a lot of you guys may know Ben, uh, who's gone to the, um, the Space Center lecture series. He's basically uh, the person who has been behind that from the beginning. And so about once every month, roughly, uh, they have a, a, a large talk in the auditorium. And so we felt like, well, he's coming to our campus and he's giving all these, uh, and he has these speakers coming and giving these talks. So I figured it's only payback that he now come here and give a talk for us. So uh, Ben has been working with uh, Ad Astra Rocket Company for a few years now. And um, he's going to be talking about the, the Vasimir project and the Vasimir engine. Okay. Thanks. In fact, I know uh, quite a few of you, but for those of you that don't know me, um, I did my undergraduate degrees, uh, master's and PhD at Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, Madison. And I came down here for a postdoc, and my postdoc advisor is kind of sitting in the back here. Uh, I think, Gary, you've seen this talk maybe three or four times already. But um, I have to give it in five weeks, so i got to, you know. Oh, yeah, okay. You're, you're <laughs> studying. <laughs> um, and then I was, oh, I was hired after the postdoc to work with the Ed Astro Rocket Company, doing largely the same uh, research that I was doing as a postdoc, a little bit different, a bit higher level program management types of things. Um, so I'm going to go through a lot of the work that I've done in the last three years, since I've been down in Houston. Um, and the, the title of the talk is Vasmir, the Future of High Power Electric Propulsion. Um, and I am from the north, so I talk very quickly. I have 75 slides, so I'm just gonna fly through these. If anybody has any questions, please don't, don't hesitate to ask. Just raise your hand and, and let me know. Um, I'll try to keep this at an at a understandable level. I'm not gonna dive into the plasma uh, physics details too, too deeply. So I'll go through um, why Vasimir, what is the motivation for doing this project to begin with. Um, and I'll give some background on other types of ion propulsion just in general. How this compares in general also to chemical propulsion. And then I'll go through uh, the lab facilities that we have here in Houston and also a wholly owned subsidiary company uh, lab in Costa Rica. And I'll go through the specific devices, the VX100, VX200, VF200, what I mean by all these acronyms, names. And uh, then where do we go from here? Some future direction for where uh, we want to go as a company. So we have two facilities, one in Houston. Uh, it's uh, actually in Webster, Texas. It's just down the road, Bay Area Boulevard and Highway 3. In fact, uh, I think maybe many of you have been there already. Uh, we have something like 20,000 square feet in this facility of mostly laboratory space, some office space and a conference room. And uh, the motivation for moving to this building just a few years ago was installing a brand new vacuum chamber and we'll go into more details about that. Um, we also have a, a laboratory in Costa Rica and 
a lot of our uh, investors come from Costa Rica, so this is a, a important point of, of our company, or important part of the business model. Uh, they do a lot of thermal work, and we'll be doing a lot of uh, lifetime work as well for the core of the Vasmir. And because of some types of uh, ITAR restrictions, we can't actually share a lot of the information that we develop in Houston with our Costa Rica lab. So they work on a, um, a subset of problems that, that exist in the Vasmir. So in general, uh, we, I think as a society, would like to explore. And to be able to do this efficiently and cost effectively, you want to have efficient rockets. Um, part of the business model of Ad Astra is going to places uh, starting from a low Earth orbit and going to places like low lunar orbits, uh, perhaps a, a Mars low uh, orbit, Mar low Martian orbit, um, and doing things like going out to Lagrange points, L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, uh, and, and perhaps slingshotting various payloads to the outer reaches of the solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, maybe even Pluto. Uh, I did a quick back of the envelope calculation and I, I calculated that we could beat the New Horizon spacecraft going out to Pluto uh, if, we, if we used the Vesemir. So, you know, we, we kind of pass and say hello. Um, so, Vesemir is an acronym, or it's a, uh, what do you call it, an anagram, or, or I forget what the term is, but uh, it stands for Variable Specific Impulse Magnetoplasma Rocket, so that's a mouthful. But uh, really, it's just a way to exhaust the propellant at a much higher uh, velocity. So. In order to do that, you need to access much higher temperatures um, in the rocket core compared to uh, chemical rockets. So in general, it has a propellant tank. It uses a propellant. And you ionize that propellant. You make it into a plasma. Uh, for those of you that are not plasma physicists, plasma is the fourth state of matter. You go solid, liquid, gas, plasma. At each phase, you're adding more energy. You're adding more heat. And you, um, you change the phase. Plasma is kind of the last phase, unless you're going to some kind of Bose-Einstein condensate or something really fancy. But um, in each case, you're adding heat. And so at this last phase, from a gas to a plasma, you're adding so much heat that you strip off an electron. And so what you're left with is this sea of charged particles, ions and electrons. And charged particles like to uh, stay confined in magnetic fields, and in some cases, uh, electric fields. And you can... You can uh, in confined plasmas in this way with magnetic fields. So that's exactly what we do. We have uh, superconducting magnets that generate uh, field lines, magnetic field lines, that are contoured to uh, a type of, of gas cylinder that we have at, at each different stage. So uh, the, the magnetic field lines in, inside of the core you know, really follow the shape of the, the physical part of the core. And the physical part of the core only exists to confine the gas um, in the first stage, and there's, there's a very small amount of residual gas in the second stage that you don't want leaking out to various parts. Um, of course, the superconducting magnets, to stay superconducting, need to be very cold. And so we, um, we have some special cryocoolers that, that cool these magnets down to cryogenic temperatures, something on the order of uh, 50 degrees Kelvin for a high temperature, quote unquote, superconductor. Uh, low temperature superconductors typically go uh, or need to operate at something like 4 degrees Kelvin. So this is like a typical MRI machine. Uh, the other critical components of, of Vasimir, just conceptually, are the different couplers. Uh, in, in, in any other world, we would call them antennas, but in NASA uh, world, we, we want to call them couplers. We don't want to imply that we're broadcasting anything. And we really don't. Um, most of the RF or all of the RF um, energy is absorbed into the plasma. So I jumped ahead a little bit and said RF, but RF is radio frequency uh, power. And so you can think of kind of like a microwave. A microwave uses um, microwaves to heat some substance in it, so like a cup of water. Um, the, the process is a little bit different, but the, the, the idea is similar. So you apply some RF power uh, to this coupler, and the coupler launches a wave into this volume. And then you heat the gas, turn it into a plasma, and then you send it downstream. Uh, you have another RF coupler, also fed by an RF uh, power supply. Uh, it, it's a different frequency. And this one is tuned so that you, instead of generate, generating a plasma, you specifically heat ions. And so these ions are trapped along the magnetic field lines that exist inside this device. 
and they gyrate around this around the magnetic field lines. And so when you heat them, they they spin up, and you um, transfer this this uh, uh, rotational energy into directed kinetic energy in the nozzle. It's a magnetic nozzle, and it doesn't have any uh, material surface. And that's that's a critical piece of information. Um, the, the typical temperatures that exist inside the, that region of the core are something like a million degrees, or, or maybe even hotter. So, of course, if you let this substance touch any material, it, one, is going to stop being a plasma, it's going to turn back into a gas, but it'll deposit its energy into that surface layer of the material. And so you can imagine surface layers of materials don't like a million degrees. <laughs> they don't stay surface layers of materials for very long. Um, okay, I think enough about the, uh, the concept. The reason for going to something like Vasemir or any type of ion propulsion is uh, efficiency. So this is just a very basic rocket equation. The mass of the final uh, rocket that you get to some destination divided by the initial mass of the rocket is somewhat proportional to uh, you know this, this function here. We have ISP, delta V, and G, and delta V is the velocity increment, the change in velocity you need to get to some destination. So that doesn't change. Um, it changes a little bit if you if you do the burn impulsively with chemical rockets, or if you uh, speed up slowly with electric propulsion, but it, it, it's a subtle detail. Uh, G is the force of gravity, <coughs> acceleration of gravity. Uh, and then you, you're left with this ISP term. So ISP is what we're changing with Vasemir. This is, this is the key. Um, in something like a chemical rocket, the best you can really do is about 450 uh, or 500 seconds. And so this means the, the exhaust is coming out from a liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen system at something like uh, 4,500 to 5,000 meters per second. That's just based on the, the temperature that it burns, and you can't really improve that. Um, there are some really fancy chemicals like fluorine reactions that can get you a little bit higher, but you're really stuck to that kind of range. Um, if you want to go to to higher ISPs and really improve, for example, the amount of payload that you get to any destination, uh, you need to improve ISP. There's really just, there's no way around it. Um, so this is what Vasemir does. We typically uh, operate at ISP ranges of something like uh, uh, 4,000, 5,000 seconds. So an order of magnitude higher than uh, the best chemical propulsion. The trade-off, of course, is that instead of carrying your energy with you in a chemical form and then just igniting it and letting it burn, you're adding energy to some propellant. So you're adding electrical energy, in this case, uh, to a propellant. So you, so you don't carry that energy with you. You have to, have to get it from somewhere. So in the, in the near-term cases that we're looking at, we're, we're using solar panels. And so we get the energy from solar panels. In some far-off uh, mission studies and, and designs that we're working on, you can get this energy from a reactor, a nuclear reactor. So in that case, you would carry it with you. But. Then, uh, just a small point, but it's delta V divided by heat. Right? Yeah, 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 you're right, sorry. Uh, so a anyway, the trade-off that you pay here is that you have a very low amount of thrust. Instead of having millions of pounds of thrust, uh, like a space shuttle main engine, you have maybe one or two pounds of thrust from an electric propulsion device. And in fact, this, this 10 newtons that we quote for uh, Vasemir, this kind of range, is very, very high for an electric propulsion device. Most electric propulsion devices, ion thrusters or hull thrusters, uh, typically generate the amount of force as, a, as the weight of a piece of paper that you hold in your hand. So, you know, we're going up to the weight of an apple or two or something like that. And, they, and of course, you operate these things for months or years, you apply this continuous amount of force and therefore acceleration on a spacecraft. Um, you don't have a lot of drag if you're if you're far away from Leo or even in Leo, uh, so you can you can just keep speeding up and speeding up. As opposed to a chemical rocket, you do your million pound burn for maybe 10 seconds and then you're done. Uh, the different types of devices that do exist other than Vasemir are uh, ion thrusters, hull thrusters, and MPD. There are other more exotic things, solar sails, and, and that kind of thing, but um, these are more more equivalent to to Vasemir. Um, so in an ion thruster, it's basically just a, an ion uh, accelerating beam. You have two grids. You bias the grids with an electric field. The ions are, are sucked through these grids and are accelerated to a high velocity. 
And then you shoot some electrons after the ions, so you, you keep the whole spacecraft charged neutrally, you're not charging anything up. Um, and that's the thruster. The limit there is you have these two grids that um, are very, very close to each other, maybe a millimeter or two um, worth of spacing. And so there's a limit to how large you can make two grids um, that are very, very close to each other without having them uh, either destroy themselves on, on launch, when you launch them from, from the Earth's surface, or having them contact each other and make a short when you're in space. So you're kind of limited to a size of about, you know, something about a meter. You can't go much bigger than that, um, just for engineering purposes. Of course, you can think about clustering these types of things, but if you want higher power and more force, you've got to cluster hundreds or maybe even thousands of them together. <coughs> Uh, hull thrusters use the hull effect to accelerate ions, so instead of first accelerating the ions uh, through a grid and then shooting electrons after them, the hull thruster uh, accelerates a neutral plasma. So I won't go into the details of this, but uh, suffice it to say that you're, you're more or less accelerating a neutral plasma through uh, some annular channel <coughs> of, the, of the hull thruster. You release gas out of, out of the back at the anode, and you flow it forward, and um, you do have a, a hollow cathode electron source on the outside uh, that, that one generates the plasma and then also uh, gives you charge equalization. Uh, an MPD thruster is another way of flowing a neutral plasma uh, through a thruster. And you can really inject a lot of power into an MPD device. Uh, it's, it's a pretty simple type of thing. You have an anode and a cathode. The anode, I've uh, if I get this right, is on the outside and the cathode is on the inside. And you, you basically flow an arc uh, between the two electrodes and you flow this gas through the thruster at the same time. This initiates a plasma discharge. And then uh, because, because of the arc and because you're flowing so much current, electrical current, uh, from the anode to the cathode, you have a self-generated magnetic field. Uh, and this collimates part of the beam and also gives you I think this is a J cross B force in, in, in any case. Uh, you can couple a lot of power to these things. The problem is you have this physical electrode in the plasma and it's eroding all the time. You have this direct plasma contact with a biased electrode. And so you can imagine if you, um, you're getting this thing extremely hot and you have a lot of current, you have an arc going to this metal electrode. So in, in uh, arc furnaces, you know, in, in, uh, when people make iron, they have arc furnaces and they have these electrodes that are consumable and they keep consuming this electrode. Um, so if you, want, if you want a device that you want to keep on for years or maybe even decades, you don't want to have consumable bits and pieces in your thruster. So th these are MPD thrusters are still in the R&D phase, um, but, but they, they may have some promise in the future. Okay, so why Vasimir? Um, I think this chart pretty much says it all. It's a chart of um, ISP, so this is basically exhaust velocity, as a function of total thrust. So you can see chemical rockets uh, are, are, are relatively low on the ISP range, but they go uh, even off the graph here, they go way off the graph to millions of newtons of thrust. Um, but if you really want high efficiency and you want to get more towards an ideal rocket, you want to be in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and I drew this graph so that Vesemir was the upper right-hand corner, but in fact, this graph you know, goes on in infinity for, for in both directions. Um, but Vesemir really operates in a, a very unique parameter space of one higher power, uh, that is higher ISP, and higher thrust. So um, the other types of ion engines are, are these low thrust types of things that also have high ISP. Um, there are other devices on there as well that are, some are R&D, some are, are used today. <clears throat> uh, so I mentioned this before, some of the applications of, of using something like a, a more ideal rocket, something like a Vasimir. Uh, you, know, you can think about doing reboost for the space station. The space station has a uh, a drag on it from the residual atmosphere at low Earth orbit. And this is something, uh, on average, that's about 0.7 newtons. Uh, it changes depending on how the solar panels are plowing into the uh, residual atomic oxygen or if they're edge on. But the average is about 0.7 newtons. So we can do this with a Vasimir uh, relatively easily, even a relatively low-powered Vasimir. Um, 
people are also talking about launching uh, space hotels. Bigelow, uh, who I think is down the street, they have uh, one part of their company down the street. Um, they're talking about launching inflatable space stations of their own to launch people to. So they're going to need a way of reboosting uh, these very large structures to play a, pl uh, a role in that. You can also think about having a, a lunar tug. So you tug something from a low Earth orbit to a low lunar orbit. Um, I didn't mention this, but uh, obviously Vasimir doesn't take off from the ground. It produces a pound of thrust. It weighs about 5,000 uh, pounds. It's not going anywhere <laughs> if you sit on the ground. It has to operate in space. It has to have no drag in an environment where you keep accelerating and keep speeding up. But if you insert it uh, between the Earth and the Moon, uh, you get significant improvement. I have a slide on that in the future. In, in the far future, maybe decades from now, you can think about using nuclear reactors to power megawatt uh, flavors of, of Vasimir, megawatt versions of Vasimir, and uh, getting people to Mars in a much shorter amount of time than with a Hohmann transfer. With um, this is a slide comparing an all-chemical mission from the Earth's surface to the lunar surface. And there are a lot of steps here, but the point is, you start with 100 metric tons, the upper left-hand corner here, and you get to, uh, you get on the surface 18 metric tons. And there are some pretty standard assumptions here, delta V assumptions and mass assumptions, and uh, using the performance of LOX hydrogen. If you then insert a Vasimir uh, tugboat between the low Earth orbit and the low lunar orbit, uh, the point is that you can get 38 metric tons onto the surface. And so if you think about this in terms of what it takes to launch 100 metric tons into low Earth orbit, uh, how much you pay to do that, um, you, you have a very strong financial incentive to insert this tugboat. If you, if you just say for, for argument's sake that getting 100 metric tons into low Earth orbit costs about a billion dollars, um, you know, doing one, one transfer of a lunar tug there's significant financial benefit to, to using something like Vesmer. And of course, you're not landing on the moon's surface. You, you bring a lander, a chemical lander, to the lunar surface. Uh, this is one embodiment, just one idea that uh, we generated. This was a two megawatt solar array powered uh, cluster of, of four Vesmers. And these solar arrays were, uh, they are state of the art. This was a stretch lens array of solar arrays. <coughs> so, uh, we're looking at doing a near-term test on the space station, the International Space Station, in, in several years. And what we would like to do is test a 200 kilowatt version of Vasimir on station. And so there are significant uh, research and development challenges that we're still working on. And we have good handles on a lot of them, but you can imagine it's difficult to reject um, a si significant fraction of 200 kilowatts worth of heat uh, in space. So. Uh, just for comparison, the whole space station rejects um, something on the order of, uh, well, I think they reject less heat than we will. So we, we're doing a lot of work in high temperature uh, radiators. We're doing a lot of work in uh, state-of-the-art solid uh, RF power supplies. We're doing a lot of work in superconducting magnets, high temperature superconducting magnets, and in, in cryocoolers that are associated with those devices. And we're shooting for an overall uh, efficiency number of 50% with the version that we launched to the space station. And we also want to do uh, you know, world-class plasma measurements once we're on station and look at lifetime as well in the core. Uh, so most of my job when I was a postdoc was looking and using a lot of the plasma diagnostics to look at the specifics of the magnetic nozzle uh, within Vasimir, and looking at the details of, say, the, the total amount of um, ion energy coming out of the rocket, total amount of plasma flux and the plasma density and, and the, those types of things. Um, so this is almost analogous, or maybe it, it, it's quite analogous, to uh, developing diagnostics that you would have in a fusion-type device, uh, say a tokamak or something like that. The energies are not all that different, and the energy um, densities are, are not all that different from that type of thing. So. Uh, I have some videos later on where the diagnostics and the sensors that we put into the plasma glow red hot. So this is a, a definite materials challenge to be able to get anything useful and meaningful out of this um, intense environment. Uh, the Costa Rica lab that we have, 
is in the Ganacast uh, region of Costa Rica. It's, Costa Rica, of course, is uh, here, and it's a very scenic place. It's a nice building. Uh, the bulk of, of the research that they do, uh, as I mentioned before, is thermal. And they do this on the first stage of Vasimir. So uh, this is just the plasma source of Vasimir. And this is all um, you know, not, not controlled under ITAR, so we can, we can do a lot of good research with them. <coughs> they uh, nominally operate at a, a power level of something like 13 kilowatts. So this is about the power level that uh, the first stage will be in the ISS version, what we're calling the VF200, that we will launch to the, to the space station. Uh, when I first arrived, I uh, arrived at what was a private company, at Astro Rocket Company, but they were still living in the NASA Advanced Space Propulsion Laboratory. And this is over on site. Uh, it was right next to the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. And the, the most current device that they were using and operating then was called the VX100. So this is Vasmir Experimental, and it was designed for 100 kilowatts worth of total RF power. And uh, the de device looks like this. And you can see the little windows between the, the two sections. So this is looking, this is the first stage, uh, the helicon section. And this is the second stage, downstream, uh, the, uh, the ion cyclotron or, or booster section. And this is uh, in the plume. So this is a window looking in the plume. And the different colors uh, tell you different things about the state of the plasma. So depending on the line emissions that are given off by the plasma, you can tell things like ionization fraction um, compared to neutral gas fraction, or you can tell things about the temperature of the electrons. Um, some of the work we did with VX100 was making a detailed map of the plume. So we did this with um, what really looks like a windshield wiper, uh, and it acts like a windshield wiper as well. It's a, a bunch of electrodes on this ceramic uh, stick. They're called Langer probes, and we, um, we didn't use them as Langer probes. We would just bias them. Um, and we would collect just ions. And so we would sweep this thing in and out of the, the plume relatively quickly so that one, it wouldn't get hot, and two, it wouldn't um, vaporize. So uh, we, we would generate, at the end of the day, we would generate these maps of what the plume would look like. And uh, a, a student named Chris Olson was doing his master's thesis on this at the time, and he published these results. And um, we got some really neat information out of, out of this data. One. Uh, major implication was that some of the helicon source was uh, asymmetric depending on the, the antenna shape or the coupler shape. So this, this plays an important role. Uh, it may tell you about um, you know, the mixture. So you, you, can think of about, you can think about a, um, a gasoline engine. Um, in some of the earlier engines you had a throttle and you had a choke and you would kind of play with the two simultaneously to adjust the fuel to air um, ratio in an engine. And it's not all that different with um, a plasma helicon source. You apply some amount of RF power, which is your throttle, and you apply some amount of um, gas flow rate, some propellant flow rate. So this is your, your choke. So we play these games, and we're playing these, these games uh, even right now in the, the current device. We'll go into that in a bit. Uh, I think this is a video, this thing operating. The, the plasma direction is flipped. It's flowing from left to right. And this thing is, this thing is, the video slowed way down, but uh, this sweeps through and gets a full map of the plume. Uh, you can also he see here a microwave interferometer. Uh, and, and this device works by launching a microwave beam <laughs> at one antenna and then receiving that beam at another antenna. It, it, the receiving antenna is a bit shadow. Um, but depending on, on how the um, uh, phase shift occurs, you can tell what the density is averaged over a line between the two receiving and transmitting antennas. So you can kind of correlate that to the uh, measurements you get from a, a flux probe. Uh, this is a similar shot. You can see the flux probe in the background here and the same microwave interferometer. Um, but now we have inserted into the plasma this little disk and it has a, uh, it's on a pendulum. So we didn't use this to, to actually measure force. This was more of a visual demonstration. But we have, um, to actually measure force, we have uh, a disc on a pendulum, but it doesn't swing. It's, it's attached to a set of strain gauges, very sensitive strain gauges. Um, 
But this is, I think this is really neat. This is uh, plasma flowing through uh, that is the density um, of something like one billionth of an atmosphere. And, you know, one billionth of, of an atmosphere is an extremely rarefied um, material. And it's going through here so quickly uh, that it's moving this, this very physical, you know, macroscopic thing. This thing weighs about the same uh, amount as a silver dollar. So to, to a plasma physicist like me, this is just astonishing that a plasma can actually apply some amount of force to a macroscopic object. And this video slowed down uh, quite a bit as well. So this, this relatively small um, but dense and heavy pendulum is really blowing in the plasma breeze, if you will. And this was just the first stage. This wasn't the booster stage. So it was designed that if, if the booster stage turned on, it would just flip right out. Um, so no one works in a vacuum. This is me working in a vacuum. But um, I, you know, we, we partner uh, with quite a few people, or Astro partners with quite a few uh, research entities, UH being one of these entities uh, with Garbering. Um, so one, one of the jobs when I was a postdoc was installing and calibrating a, a force target, a, a very sensitive force target. So uh, as I mentioned, this is a, a disc attached to a, uh, an insulating rod, and then it's attached to uh, a very set of a set of very sensitive strain gauges. And so this can detect, um, you know, someone kind of just looking at it. You can you can almost just walk by, and this will detect the, the vibrations. But um, it, it's this sensitive so that we could calibrate it against other electric propulsion devices. Uh, the trick with Vasimir is that it's big, it's very heavy, and it weighs something like 5,000 pounds even as a laboratory device. And you want to measure one pound of force. So you can imagine putting this thing on a thrust stand, as is typically done with any rocket, is tricky. If you mount this 5,000 pound thing, you want to measure one pound. Um, so we don't do that. And what we what we choose to do instead is, is put uh, this force target into the plume, into the exhaust, and uh, fire the plume at it, and then make a map, a two-dimensional map, of the force density of the plume, and then integrate that. <clears throat> so this was a relatively new method of, of detecting force in a rocket plume. Uh, so we wanted to, to verify that we were on the right track and weren't fooling ourselves with Vasimir. So we took it up to the University of Michigan and calibrated it against a, a well-known um, hull thruster um, that's been studied, studied to death. So this is the device that was used, a graphite target on a stick, and a set of very sensitive strain gauges mounted in an isthmus of metal to amplify the strain in that one location. Uh, this is inside also a, a very large vacuum chamber at the University of Michigan with um, a, a setup with a hull thruster. This was the particular hull thruster that we use. It operates on a gas, uh, xenon gas. I'm just going to flip through here. Again, we're not measuring the total force. We're measuring some fraction of the total force, and then we integrate this. I'm not going to go into the details. Um, but the results uh, that came out, so, so the, the reason that we also went to Michigan and used this particular hull thruster is that this hull thruster is small, and it's mounted on a, a thrust stand. So we could make these two measurements uh, side by side in parallel at the same time. And we wanted to calibrate the, the technique. So we're very happy to see results that um, lie right on top of each other. Forgive me if you can't really see the details, but that's the point. <laughs> you can't see the difference, much of a difference. Um, and we moved, we, we did a whole parameter scan. We changed the, the total force of the thruster, the total um, ISP of the thruster, the flow rate of the thruster, the distance of the force target, and it didn't really matter um, how you change these things, it was all about the same. But that was good news. So we took that force target back to Houston and we use it even today. Um, now stepping through some of the devices of Vasmu and some of the very specific devices. Um, this is the VX200i, and I stands for interim. It was a technology test bed, and it was developed to test um, mostly the RF components, the solid state RF generators which uh, were state-of-the-art and developed by a company called, called Nautel in Canada. <clears throat> uh, this is the VX200i in our vacuum chamber in Houston, and um, you could literally drive a school bus into this vacuum chamber and then close the door. It's about that size. And we wanted to, get, to upgrade to something like this size 
uh, so that we can really study the plume in the magnetic nozzle in detail. So this is the perfect place to do it. You can see uh, one of the transmission lines for an RF generator coming uh, from the air side, coming into the vacuum chamber, uh, going to the Vesmir uh, rocket. You can see the second stage. This is the ICH line or the booster uh, RF transmission line. And we have some other things on here, a, a flight computer and pressure measurement and other sensors and diagnostics specific to the rocket. Um, it, the vacuum chamber totals about 150 cubic meters uh, worth of volume and you can see some of our laboratory equipment on the side here. And it's also about the biggest chamber you can ship on the highway. So, <laughs> otherwise you build the vacuum chamber in place and you weld everything in place. Um, this is really a unique facility, uh, except for maybe Chamber A here uh, on site at JSC, and, and perhaps a few chambers in Ohio, also, also NASA owned. Uh, this is one of the largest vacuum chambers that you can, uh, that also has a, a diagnostics motion table with such a large range. So we have this uh, set of rails and a, a ball screw, and another set of rails and a ball screw where we mount our diagnostics to this platform and we can, we can map out this whole uh, five meter by two meter uh, region in the plume, in the exhaust plume. <laughs> so this is important to us. We wanted to study the, the physics details in, in the magnetic nozzle. This is a new feature of, of any type of plasma rocket. Uh, these are some more shots of the motion table and a lot of the uh, plasma diagnostics on the table. So we have two devices that measure ion energy uh, these are called RPAs, Retarding Potential <coughs> Energy Analyzers. Uh, this is the force target that was calibrated up in Michigan and then brought back. Uh, this was the windshield wiper uh, diagnostic. Now, it, now it's, just, it's just stationary. Uh, and another Langer probe, another electrode probe. Uh, the VX200i was not a superconducting device. It was just a regular old... Uh, Electromagnet. So this used copper tubing. We would flow water through the copper tubing, and we would flow current through the copper. Um, flowing current through the copper makes the copper so hot that you need to water cool it, otherwise the copper just melts. Um, and so, of course, you don't want to do this in space. You don't want to have fluid pumps and wasteful uh, resistive heating in the copper lines. So you want to use a superconducting magnet. But they're expensive, and this is what we did in the uh, interim while we're waiting for this magnet. <coughs> Um, and, and again, mainly testing the RF generators. This is the solid state generator. Just this little cylinder part in here is a solid state RF generator for the first stage and then the, the same one for the second stage. Um, and just to give an idea, uh, these things weigh, I don't know if I have the weight up there, something like 50 kilograms or maybe less than that. Um, but their, their brothers, the non-solid state RF generators, weigh something like two or three or four tons. So they're, they're just these beasts of machines. And um, of course, you don't want to fly anything in space that is very heavy, uh, considering that getting into space, getting anything into low Earth orbit costs about $10,000 per kilogram. So you want to fly very light things. Uh, they're very light things. And very high power uh, devices as well for solid state. Uh, again, these are some of the magnetic field lines I've been mentioning uh, going through the core. Uh, we don't show the boundaries here, but you can see the first couple and the second couple. And uh, the tests were, were quite successful, even though the total magnetic field strength was only about a tenth of the uh, strength that we have now with a superconducting uh, magnet. But we were able to, to fully uh, test the RF generators. Um, again, a lot of my job during the three years of being at, at Astro was um, using all of the plasma diagnostics to put together a coherent picture of, of how the uh, exhaust operates and how the magnetic field uh, nozzle also operates. You can see just a, a very small subset of some of these things that, that we do. This is a uh, flux density map just overlaid with a, a picture of the plume. Uh, the same thing here, just a different cross-section. Um, force density maps across the plume. Uh, just an, a schematic example of, of the microwave interferometer that we've uh, put in this chamber. And we also use uh, optical spectra to look at what the, what the plasma is doing, temperature of the plasma, and that type of thing. Um, Gar and I are working on publishing a paper coming up here. Um, we, we think we've 
kind of cracked open a, a big mystery in uh, some plasma physics. So we're excited about this. This uh, relates to what people call double layers. Um, we're kind of refuting what, what some of the research has been saying. So we're excited about this paper coming up. Uh, to take some of this data, we had a, uh, an extension uh, probe for about a week, I was called Dr. Proctor for sticking this probe up the business end of the <laughs> 200 kilowatt rocket. Um, but we got some very interesting results, so it, it, it was a lot of fun doing this type of thing. Um, and, and it's in a very different uh, regime of, of plasma physics. The intense magnetic field, the large chamber, the large uh, size that we're able to explore. So I'm going to sk skip over some of these details of the, the plasma physics, but um, we found out that we were being very conservative with some of our efficiency uh, models of Vasmir. We were able to um, increase the total amount of uh, efficiency that, that our models were not taking into account by doing some of this research. Uh, I think this is the last VX200i slide, but the, the real culmination of hitting our, our milestone was getting um, 150 kilowatts of RF power into a plasma. Uh, with this type of device. So this is a, a record and really a world record for a plasma rocket. Um, this has never been done before. Uh, and this is just a sequence of, of photos uh, also for VX200i from no plasma to helicon discharge to um, 150 kilowatts worth of uh, a booster stage power. And you can see the camera is completely saturated but plasmas are finicky like that. <clears throat> so we put to rest the VX200i and started the VX200 uh, so this is a fully superconducting device. It's a low temperature superconductor, so this is not what we will fly, but it's very close to what we will fly. Uh, the weight is similar, but even a little bit heavier than high temperature superconductors. Uh, but it, let us, it lets us test the rocket at um, almost two Tesla worth of magnetic field, and so that's equivalent to uh, a modern day MRI machine in a hospital. So. We have to take all these safety uh, precautions as well. Uh, if you've been to an MRI scanning machine, you know you have to take off all the metal and you can't go in the room with these types of things. Uh, luckily, the rocket is contained within a, a very big vacuum chamber, so we don't get very close to it, but we also have a pacemaker keep-out zone and, and that type of thing. Uh, this is a schematic of the cryostat of the low-temperature superconducting magnet. Uh, we have this cryostat, it's really just a can that surrounds the superconducting magnet. And we do this because um, any propellant that flows out of Vasmir and then wanders its way back up to the rocket would freeze onto the, onto the four degree Kelvin superconductor. So you take this gas and you would freeze it into a, an argon ice, uh, for example. So you don't want to do this. You want to keep your superconductor cold at four degrees Kelvin. And if you keep freezing a whole bunch of propellant onto it, you'll heat it up. So we have this uh, vacuum chamber within a vacuum chamber to prevent all of this. Um, we do quite a bit of cryogenics testing. This is the superconducting magnet. It's wrapped in aluminized mylar. It's a radiation uh, heat barrier. But it's, it's actually relatively small and thin and lightweight and much more close uh, to something that you'd want to fly. And these are cooled with uh, uh, laboratory grade uh, cryo coolers. So they have a helium loop, and it's kind of—it's basically like a refrigerator. Refrigerator has some type of, uh, you know, fluid loop. It's—I forget what the stuff is. It, it, it was Freon, but now they've replaced it with something else. Um, instead of Freon, we use helium, so it's a different type of fluid that doesn't freeze at four degrees Kelvin. Uh, so it goes through this loop and it rejects all the heat to. Uh, we have some processed water. Uh, you don't want to take these these big boxes that that do this helium looping into space. They're very heavy and cumbersome. So. What we would like to use are very small uh, cryocoolers, and uh, people make these. They are space flight rated cryocoolers. They are about the size of a wine bottle, and they almost do the same job as one of these um, large, very heavy boxes. So you can see a trend in a lot of the technology things we're after, very lightweight, small devices. Um, is it skin? Is it LTA, or how does it work? Well, uh, the cryocoolers are a free piston Stirling cycle. It, it's a free piston Stirling cycle. So it's a Stirling cycle. It also uses helium, but it, they don't have lines. They don't have helium lines. It's an enclosed uh, helium loop. Okay. Uh, the, the major milestone that was hit with VX200 was getting to 200 kilowatts. In this case, we hit 201 kilowatts worth of RF power injected into the rocket. 
uh, this time at uh, nearly full magnetic field strength. So this was a, a big achievement. And we've been running um, uh, Vasimir now for on the order of up to 60 seconds um, at a continuous burn. What we're limited to now and what we're running into is a, uh, a thermal solution with Vasimir. So we designed the core so that we could very quickly uh, do our research and development on all of the technology pieces. And we, um, we haven't arrived at a full steady state thermal solution. So what we usually do is pulse the rocket and then let, it, let the core heat up for some amount of time and then we turn it off and let it cool back down. Then we'll, we'll have some duty cycle doing this. In space, we won't do that. Uh, you would want to just operate it continuously. But actually on, on the ISS uh, test bed, we will also have to have a duty cycle, this time not for thermal reasons, but for power uh, reasons. I'll go into a, a bit more detail later on. Uh, again, a similar type of thing, but this time you're going from uh, no plasma to helicon to full power, um, full magnetic field strength. And you can, you can notice that the, just the color of the plume is much more intense blue. It's like a royal blue. And it, this has to do, again, with the ionization state of the plasma. So it's much more highly ionized than the previous uh, VX200i. This is the comparison. And you're, the, the thing that you're changing here, uh, or that we're changing, is the magnetic field strength. So you're going from one tenth field to 100% field. Um, there's a lot more detail involved here. But this is a movie of the uh, full power VX200 firing. And we're ramping up in ICH power, and the flickering you see is just the white balance, the, the aperture setting on the camera, readjusting. <laughs> So we turned the fir first stage on, that was the second stage, and then it went back down the first stage and then off. Is there, is there a problem with how long you can run it because of uh, ruining your vacuum after a while? Or? Well, we, we have enough vacuum pumping capability that we can run continuously uh, with our vacuum system. Yeah, so that's, that's okay. In the past, when we were at NASA, we couldn't do that. But you'd build up too much gas and you'd ruin the vacuum, yeah. That's right. That's a good question. This is another uh, edge-on view. This time we have a whole bunch of diagnostics that we're trying to fry. <laughs> we <laughs> stick them very close to get good measurements, but you can see them glowing red hot for some amount of time. So you can imagine there's a very limited subset of materials that you can glow red hot and have them um, stay survivable, mainly uh, refractory metals and uh, high-temperature ceramics, graphite. Uh, I, I think just the same video here with the lights off. And again, you're, you're kind of ratcheting up in uh, booster power in, in ICH power. The afterglow of things being a thousand degrees Celsius. Uh, Windows is going to complain to me there. And then we also have uh, a probe that hangs down it's for a calibration reason. And the sound you hear in the background are the cryo compressors um, for both the magnet and for pumps that we have in the vacuum chamber. Uh, like I said, we don't want to freeze and condense our, our propellant into an ice on the magnet. The, the pumps that we have in the vacuum chamber do exactly that. That's how they pump. They turn any residual gas in the chamber into ice, either water ice or oxygen ice or nitrogen ice or argon ice, which is our propellant. But that's how we do the, the majority of our high vacuum pumping. Um, so I started here when I started the, the talk, the VX100. I, I came online with the project in 2007. Um, we're now doing VX200, and let's see, we're at 2010 now. And our next um, milestones are, are really out here. We have some interim research and development with materials and a, a few other things, but most of the major physics um, is already proven. In, in fact, that was proven with VX100. Um, Gar has a nice paper out in the uh, in POP that remind me of the acronym is physics of, plasma. physics of plasmas. Yeah, thank you. So Gar, Gar can supply a very nice paper on, on all of the physics details uh, using the VX100 device. And our, our mission now is to launch and test uh, the first version of a space-rated, fully qualified VASMIR on, on the space station in late 2013. Um, and then go on to commercial applications directly after this. Um, one thing that I've been involved in, this is just a, a couple of side slides, but one thing that I've uh, been involved in here in testing some of the components uh, for spaceflight, um, uh, one project I've been working on is, is testing and verifying the cryocoolers that we'll use to cool down the high temperature superconducting magnet. And so uh, we have a project to fly these cryocoolers in zero gravity, so on the vomit comet, 
NASA's Vama Comet that flies out of uh, Ellington Field here. And so it flies this parabolic shape and you get about 23 seconds of zero gravity. You can qualify these crowd coolers at, um, at a very low temperature. They've never been run at this low of a temperature in zero gravity. So we're looking for efficiency numbers on the crowd cooler. Um, the plane literally flies that angle up and down. Um, I've gone through some hyperbaric chamber testing to make sure I won't pass out. Uh, if, should the plane become depressurized, this is a, a NASA safety protocol. Um, some things we also have to do before flight and before going to um, a fully qualified uh, ISS mission is doing the plasma modeling. So um, some of you may know or may not know that uh, when the space station is flying around in low Earth orbit, uh, there is a plasma environment that it's flying through. There's also a, a very thin and tenuous neutral environment. Uh, but most of the particles that exist are uh, ionized and atomic oxygen. Um, so the, the ISS is, is flying through this environment and you have this big magnetic field and you want to make sure that you're not going to um, cause any ill effects to the space station, to the solar arrays and, and that kind of thing. Uh, another thing you're doing is injecting a whole bunch of uh, plasma into the ionosphere as well, so you want to make sure that you're playing nicely with, um, with everything else on the station when you're, when you're doing this. And so we do a lot of this modeling uh, in-house. This is one embodiment of what, what the VF200 uh, would look like. It's, it's changed uh, shapes by now. This is a bit of an old graphic, but uh, NASA generated this one for us. And this is just one site location that we're considering. This is the P3 uh, Zenith location. I'm going to zoom out in the next slide here so you can get a better feel for where uh, these locations could be. Uh, another location is P3 uh, Nader, looking down. And um, really the location that is best for us and the best location that you would choose for a rocket is something that uh, fires in the opposite direction that the spacecraft is flying. So to do that, we would really like to go on the Z1 truss and fire out um, in the opposite direction of the velocity vector. And this would also reboost the space station some amount. Um, we do our testing. Our testing will be done at 200 kilowatts. This is the full power of the VF200. Um, but the space station doesn't have that much power. And at any location that we would attach to, whether it be Z1 or some other location, the uh, station can only provide several kilowatts of power, maybe two or three. So you can't run a 200 kilowatt rocket on two kilowatts of power. So what we do, uh, what we're planning on doing is taking a large battery pack up with us, lithium uh, batteries, char trickle charging the battery pack, and then firing the rocket uh, for up to 15 minutes, and then repeating that cycle. <coughs> and so there will be some duty cycle in how many times we can fire uh, because of that power limitation. Uh, this is just a zoom in of the Again, one embodiment of the VF200. You can see the high temperature solar array, uh, I'm sorry, high temperature uh, radiators. So these reject the waste heat from the rocket. Um, the rocket, again, we're looking at a 50% efficiency. So if you have a 200 kilowatt rocket and you have 50% efficiency, this means you have to reject 100 kilowatts worth of heat. Uh, we don't want to have these huge farms of radiators, so we, we do this at a very high temperature. And this will be a, a first uh, in space. John, you want to explain why there's two of them? Yeah, yeah. John brings up a, a good point here. Uh, instead of having just one rocket with a magnetic field uh, streaming out of that, we have two. And we have two that are anti-parallel. So we have one magnetic field uh, uh, in one rocket and an anti-parallel magnetic field in the other. So you essentially have uh, north, you have a north pole at, at one nozzle and you have a south pole at the other. And so you cancel the net dipole of the magnetic field by doing this. If you didn't do this and you only had one core, and this rocket were mounted somewhere out on a, on a wing, on a, on a truss, you would torque the station in such a way that you would make the station a compass needle. You can imagine the astronauts flying in the space station don't want the space station to be a compass needle always pointing north as they go around. They want to be in a very precise um, attitude. So to prevent this, you, you do this, uh, what people call a quadrupole, and this cancels the net dipole moment of the magnetic field. So if you draw a bubble very far away uh, of this rocket, if you draw a bubble around this and add up all the you know, magnetic field, you have a net zero. Um, we're also working on, uh, as I mentioned before, some of the mission analysis. 
think in the bottom left corner we have a, a Jupiter slingshot. So this idea, uh, you actually slow down, you leave Earth's sphere of influence and you slow down and you dip in towards uh, Venus and, and almost to Mercury's orbit and then you start speeding up um, and you, you're carrying some payload and then, it's, it's a little hard to see, at <coughs> Blue Line I believe, you release the payload and at this point you're on a, uh, an elliptical trajectory towards Jupiter and then you bring your spacecraft back, you bring Vazimir back um, and then pick up a new payload and then do another slingshot. So in this way you can fling out um, relatively large spacecraft, large payloads, uh, fling them out to the outer planets, Jupiter for example, uh, in a very short amount of time. I think this one particular trajectory was getting a payload to Jupiter in something like 18 months. Um, and the, the payload is, is significant uh, compared to uh, a chemical mission where you know it can take up to three or six years depending on which gravity assist you do off of off of which planet. So I, I Gar is a uh, or, or Gar knows a lot of planetary uh, physicists, and I just can't imagine having a career where you start uh, your career and you design the spacecraft and then it's launched out and you wait a decade before you get any results back. Uh, this is this is heartbreaking almost if you <laughs> if the spacecraft breaks. You spent your career doing this type of thing. So instead of waiting, you know, ten years to get to a destination like Pluto or six years for a destination like Jupiter. Um, you have this, you know, solar system slingshot uh, type of idea. And we're also doing some near-term uh, mission analysis for a, a Mars sample return or a Phobos sample return um, using even the, the VF-200 as a, as a rocket. Not, not needing uh, or not waiting for a nuclear reactor to come online that is megawatts worth of power. Uh, in, the, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this video. We can come back to it if people are interested. Uh, this is a, a neat animation between two satellites that collided. It was a, a defunct Russian satellite and the Iridium uh, satellite that was active and operating. And we'd like to offer a commercial trash service to prevent collisions like this and to deorbit uh, specific spacecraft. So these actually collided, they, they produced these uh, debris fields that were then tracked. Um, the second it's going to project all of the artificial satellites we have up in orbit with these debris fields. And you can imagine that it's almost like a, a supercritical reaction in a nuclear bomb that it, it, in some cases if you release this debris field into the um, existing satellite base you just get this supercritical effect. Here you have the existing uh, satellite base and then this debris field track uh, moving sphere. Uh, and again, we've been talking about this Jupiter slingshot idea here. It's, it's laid out a bit more niche, um, where you start at Earth, slow down for some period of time, and then you start speeding up again, release the payload, fling the payload off to Jupiter, and then return your craft uh, back to the Earth's sphere of influence to pick up a new payload. And, and here it lays out some specifics. This is a 4,000 second uh, ISP. Efficiency of 60%, uh, power of 500 kilowatts at Earth, starting at Earth. <clears throat> so, this is all I have for now. I'd like to thank Ad Astra and, uh, of course, UH as well. Right. Questions? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, or not? It, it's similar. It, they were built by the same company. I believe they're made out of the same uh, wire. Our so, low temperature one is. So are you guys at all concerned about having the same trouble that AMS is? Yeah. <laughs> well, we've had similar troubles as AMS actually. It, we haven't advertised it, and it's not been as public. But uh, we can only produce 80% of our designed magnetic field in the VX200 um, because of a heat leak, and. Uh, I'm sure you maybe you're aware of the details of AMS, but AMS has a heat leak that boils away all of its helium in something like I, I think I've heard about a month or something like this, and it's supposed to last two, two or three years. Okay, yeah. 
So because they have a more significant heat leak than we do, um, but because we have a this small heat leak, uh, we can only operate at 80% of our field. So it's it's a, it's a similar problem. It's not the exact same problem, but it's it's similar. Uh, we are going with a different vendor for our high temperature superconducting magnet, uh, and it, it actually uses different wire. It uses a tape with a thin film of superconductor instead of this low temperature superconducting wire, but. Um, we are very concerned about these types of, of heat leaks. Um, and you know, this is, the, the magnet that was built for us by Scientific Magnetics was the largest cryogen-free uh, superconducting magnet that was ever built by anyone. Um, and so you can, you can imagine this is kind of the bleeding edge of, of technology and there are mistakes that, that happen along the way. Uh, this was on their end, but the, the magnet we're designing in the future will have some, some buffer to for these types of things. Yeah? Did I understand you to say that, uh, that some facilities were located in Costa Rica because that's where your investors were? Yeah, that's right. So Ad Astra is a private company and uh, the money that we have that we have so far is from private investment. And so most of the private investors that, uh, that we have are from Costa Rica or they're interested in uh, investing in Costa Rican companies. We're a U.S. company, but we, you know, we have the, the Costa Rican lab there. So yeah, you, you were right. In, I, wasn't in right. I, I wasn't sure that I heard you correctly. It seems kind of a strange place to raise capital, actually, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's right. We, we also have uh, U.S. investors and European investors. It started to expand. Is this company founded by a South American astronaut? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the company was formed by uh, and founded by Franklin Chang Diaz. Who is from Costa Rica? He was born in Costa Rica. Goodness, yeah. President Obama's budget, I believe, specifically calls out Ion Motors as research and development projects for the next big rocket, something to take us to Mars in, in a short time. And yet, I think you said that's uh, that's decades away if things work out really well. Is that? Am I quoting you correctly there? Well, yeah. The. Um, so you need two things to get to Mars. You need a good rocket and you need a good power source. Um, and both things don't exist right now. The, if, if you want to launch humans to Mars, you need megawatts worth of power and a rocket that can, that can handle megawatts worth of power. Process that, that amount of fuel and that amount of power. Um, you know, both of those things don't exist right now and, and really it, it, it could be a decade away until those types of devices do exist even if you give it uh, you know, billion dollars, billions of dollars worth of, of capital. Yeah? How are you going to get this to the space station? Well, so it needs a, a traditional chemical rocket. Uh, we're looking at either Orbital Sciences or SpaceX. It, uh, we're designing uh, to those specific fairings, those rocket fairings. Yeah? I think I heard you mention both uh, argon and xenon. Uh, what is the choice of the materials uh, depending on? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a really good question. And that goes back into um, some of the fundamentals of electric propulsion. Um, typical electric propulsion uh, thrusters use xenon gas. And this is because the xenon gas is very easy to form into a plasma. It's very easy to ionize. So that, that first electron to strip off is low ionization energy. Um, you also... Uh, want to derate the ion thrusters. So ion thrusters, you have these two grids and you want to run them at a very high voltage so that you don't have to run a lot of current through the, the grids and the wires and all of that. Because you have ohmic losses if you run a lot of current. You want to run high voltage. Just like a, a transmission line, you know, from state to state, they have these very high voltage transmission lines. So they do that so they reduce ohmic losses. In any case, uh, you want to operate the grids at very high voltage. So if you do that and you use it on a gas that is much lighter than xenon, um, say a hydrogen or something like that, you would shoot out the ions at, at too high of a velocity that it would be inefficient. High, high. Isn't high velocity good? It's not always good. Um, you want to you want to tune um, you want to tune the velocity so that it's about double the spacecraft velocity to, to, to maximize your efficiency. Otherwise, you can get into a regime where, given the limited amount of power that you have for any ion thruster, it has a limited amount of power from its solar panels. Um, you want to either invest that in uh, the speed, the exhaust speed, 
or in the total number of particles coming out. Mm -hmm. So you have this trade-off to play. Do you want more thrust at a lower ISP, or do you want a, a higher thrust, or I'm sorry, do you want a lower thrust at a high ISP, or do you want a high thrust at a low ISP? You can, you can pick a trade-off. And ion thrusters and hull thrusters all have uh, a relatively narrow range uh, parameter space where they want to operate at. So you can't really throttle an ion engine or a hull thruster very well. They have kind of a fixed thrust and a fixed ISP. Um, Vesmir, we have these, these two stages. So depending on the amount of power ratio between the first stage, which generates plasma, and the second stage, which accelerates plasma, we can um, have a deep throttle range. Right. And one of the limiting factors in the, in the use of argon is how much argon is available. Uh, there was a paper presented at the IUGG in 2003 by Matsumoto who pointed out that if all of the proposed electric propulsion uh, uses of argon came to fruition, we'd run out of argon this century. <laughs> so we do actually want to transition to more common ions sometime in the near term. Yeah. Well, air's got 1% argon. You don't need xenon. I meant argon. That's Moto's paper was quite clear. He was talking about one of the missions that's been proposed is putting space solar power space uh, stations in GEO uh, in, in the giga to terawatt range. Now that's a heavy lift. Mm -hmm. And that will use up most of the argon in, on the planet. Okay. Anyway, I didn't really answer your question. <laughs> so we use argon because um, it's relatively easy to ionize and it's a specific weight. Um, it, it's a little bit lighter. We're also looking at things like neon gas and krypton gas. Um, and if you look at the periodic table, you have helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. And they're all noble gases. They're all easy to ionize. Um, they're easier to ionize the heavier they get. So you, you play this trade-off in ionization energy and weight. The ionization energy you don't get back. Either. That's right. Yeah, that's right. You invest that and you don't get that back. With the recent changes in the political direction in terms of you know, gas space exploration, have you seen uh, an increase in the interest of investors and potential investors? Yeah, um, we, we absolutely have. Yeah, yeah, we have. Uh, we're, we're still hoping that Obama comes, comes by on April 15th to Florida and, and announces some big mission to Mars, but um, you know, the, NASA is going through a transition now, and, and people are talking about game-changing technologies. And they're talking about Vasmir as one of these game-changing technologies. It's the rocket that's in the upper right-hand corner. Um, so this is the type of rocket you'd like to have. Yeah. I might have missed that point. Is there a possibility to get some fuel on the way from the moon or somewhere else? Is it possible to get what from the moon? To get in some fuel like medium three or something like that from... Yeah, you, you absolutely can. So the, the, also, the, the point of Vasmir is that it can also uh, run on different types of fuels. So you, again, you play this trade-off between ionization efficiency and, and mass of the particle, which relates to the exit velocity. But uh, you could essentially operate on uh, oxygen or uh, hydrogen. We, we've actually operated on hydrogen, uh, uterium, neon, argon, nitrogen. Uh, one more question. Okay. Yeah. How long is the fuel going to last for that system? Uh, this is still something in design, but nominally we're looking at 300 shots worth of uh, better 15 minutes now. Something like that. Once that comes out, that's it. It will be done. Yeah. No, it, and it's not really made for uh, a reboost type of mission. We're going to design it so that it will have a refuel capability, a, an injection port. So that if in the future it, it wants to be used as a, a reboost, it has the capability. Yeah. All right, let's thank our speaker again.